have with me a guest, a very special guest, a peds gastroenterologist, Dr. Barry Steinmetz. Hello. Hello. Let's get on screen here. Here we are. I'm going to give you guys a quick background. And for those of you who are joining for the first time, you can watch this after the fact mm -hmm. on Dr. Aviva Alishmirni YouTube or on Facebook. I'm going to give you guys a little background about Dr. Steinmetz. And then this is open for live Q&A, but we did pick some great topics that come up often in the pediatric, uh, in the pediatric setting. So Dr. Steinmetz, who I know well and was trained um, under at UCI in residency, he did his medical school residency at Baylor College of Medicine and the Texas Children's Hospital. Dr. Steinmetz completed his fellowship at UCLA. Dr. Steinmetz is affiliated with Miller Children's Hospital, Fountain Valley Regional Medical Center, and Torrance Memorial Medical Center. He is a clinical professor of pediatrics at the, at the University of California, Irvine. His areas of interest include inflammatory bowel disease, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and pediatric endoscopic procedures. Dr. Steinmetz is an active member of the medical community with memberships in several professional organizations, including the American College of Gastroenterology, the American Gastroenterology Association, and the North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hep Hepatology, and Nutrition. He is personally responsible for adopting cutting edge technologies at Miller Children's Hospital, which I was lucky enough to experience firsthand, including the Bravo PH probe, high resolution manometry, and capsule endoscopy for pediatric patients. Dr. Steinmetz also serves at the serves at the medical direct as the medical director for outpatient services and is the associate director of pediatric gastroenterology and nutrition at Children's Miller's Child at Miller's Children's Hospital. His work has appeared in several publications and abstract papers, and he continues to conduct ongoing research on gastroenterological conditions. Dr. Steinmetz has been awarded Physician of the Year and Outstanding Faculty of the Year numerous times. In November of 20, 2009, he was awarded the prestigious Munzer Family Award, which is presented annually within the Memorial Health Care System, recognizing him for his excellence in teaching and research. Dr. Steinmetz enjoys spending his free time with his wife and two daughters. His passions in include travel with his family, mountain biking, and fine wines. I'm lucky to have Dr. Steinmetz here because I do call on him often enough mainly because he's everyone's top pick for the best bedside manner, takes his time and really cares for his patients. Orange County does tend to get overwhelmed with large quantities of people waiting to be seen by specialists, but Dr. Steinmetz seems to always take his time with all his patients, no matter who they are. And that speaks volumes and has echoed throughout the walls of pediatric clinics. I think his name pops up first in the forums when doctors are asking each other, who, who would you send your kid to? I have a problem with my kiddo, a GI problem. So thank you so much for being here. Your time is invaluable. Um, we have some topics to go through. Is there anything I missed on your background? And I can tell people where to find you, but why don't you let them know the best way to reach you if they are interested in a consult? Uh, well, we have a website, uh, SoCal Kids GI, uh, so, SoCal Kids uh, GIKids.com. Uh, you can also call our office number at 949-646-6224 and get directed to any of the locations that might be closest to you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So our first topic, which is something I'm passionate about, I tell everyone I'm passionate about poop. There's no question it comes up in every visit. Are, are my patients stooling? regularly and what does their stool look like? I make them look at the Bristol stool chart. So I asked you to t speak on this subject, this very important subject, because I think depression, anxiety, they're all linked to having constipation and eating healthy is linked to constipation. So um, my first question for you is, what is normal versus abnormal stool stooling and why is chronic constipation such a serious problem? Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with you as well. It is a very important topic. It's one people may think, well, I don't want to talk to a physician about, but it's actually one of the most fundamental parts of, of, of life, I guess. Um, and it's very important. And some of the things about constipation, 
the technical definition for constipation for a doctor, according to our parent society of GI, North American Association of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition, just mm -hmm. the parent society, is an alteration of bowel habits to a less frequent or more firm type that causes undue distress to the patient. Mm -hmm. So what the key thing there is to notice is there's not thou shalt poop once a day or mm -hmm. once every other day. There is not necessarily a prescribed amount. It's what does it cause a problem? So you can be stooling every three days, being no problems. It doesn't cause it doesn't cause problems with eating, doesn't cause problems with pain, doesn't cause any any sort of issues. And that can be completely normal. For someone who has a bowel movement three times a day, it can be absolutely normal as well. So you have to make sure that that you understand that that that's the way it becomes a disease process or a problem, rather than you have to go at a certain prescribed amount. One of the other questions I, I, I make very clear with my patients is that sometimes when they have a feeling that they need to go and can't, they call that constipation. But as you know, there are some diseases that make you have, feel an urge to go and there is no stool. And many times when they do have a stool, it's diarrheal, at which point that's not constipation. That's an urgency to go. So I try to make those delineations. Um, in general, it's such a prominent uh, issue these days because I think the vast majority of, of the United States, especially as, as children and especially as adolescents, don't drink nearly the water that you need to. I saw you just got some hydration in there and uh, it's very important. But if you think about what's going on in schools these days, before everything was Zoom, you would get taken away by for going to use the restroom uh, to urinate or something. So kids would be chronically dehydrated. They're not drinking what they should. And this is one of the lead problems besides diet that, that leads to constipation. Okay, great. There's a little delay in your camera, but your voice is coming in just fine. Okay. So, but, I, <laughs> but we, <laughs> you know, your, your face is right there. So that's okay. We're getting the, the voice. Um, Yes, wonderful. And I did recently update my page um, under parent resources about new macronutrients such as water, fats, carbohydrates. But I was shocked. My five-year-old needs to be having 1.2 liters per day of water. That is so hard to do and we're working on it. But, um, you know, we get this pushback that the more you talk about it, the more it's a fight. So mm -hmm. I w we did this new thing where you said, listen to your body. And that, that's kind of cool because um, I'll pull up the Bristol stool chart, but I said, this is what poop is supposed to look like. And he started to realize, oh, my poop doesn't look like it should. I need to drink more water. Do you want me and to vegetables, shake? Vegetables yeah. and fiber as well. But yes, if water, if you're a 60 pound child, you should be taking close to 1.5 liters of fluid intake. Now that, that includes all fluid sources, but if you're not taking a good 800 milliliters or almost a liter of, of, of fluid on top of it, you're probably not reaching where you really should be. And this comes to a very simple point that we need to be act like scientists with our children for a short period of time. You need to actually track these things and find out so you learn yourself. Same with foods and food groups and calories and fat. It seems yes. like, oh, my, you know, my kid's healthy. No, you need to actually know because... They could be healthier. There could be something you're missing if you're not paying attention. Well, the problem is, is once you once you're once you're out of toilet training stage and mm -hmm. they're on their own, many parents, including myself, you, you wouldn't. And I'm a GI doctor. You wouldn't know what's going on. It's not something you pay attention to unless they come to you with a problem. You, mm -hmm. you don't have the information. So one of the first things, if you have a concern, is is absolutely in a sense you have to be like a scientist. You have to get the information. You have to know on average how often does. Does, does your child stool? How often do they tend to be hard? How often do they struggle? How often do you potentially see blood? Um, which is another thing that people get very concerned about. But the good news is the vast majority of blood in, in, in a young child is due to constipation. And that, that's a much better situation than, say, someone who might be in their 70s or 80s. True. Now, um, I've sent you plenty of people with constipation. Uh, let's see. I'm just making sure there's no questions. And they come back and I learn always something new. And I am wondering if there's any tips that you would like to share. One thing I came across that was great was magnesium chews. I know that I know that you and other GI docs will add magnesium when there's chronic constipation. So I saw that, you know, this product calm, they have the calm gummies. 
And then I would even go as far as these fiber gummies. And that's when someone came back and said, oh, you know what? That wasn't the best treatment plan because it actually worsens the bulk forming component and constipation, we have to retrain the colon. So do you want to speak to that and why we wouldn't do fiber gummies for a child with chronic constipation? Do you want me to show some of the images? Sure, sure, we can show some of the images. Um, it, it comes to the, to the difference between a intermittent kid that has hard stools or firm stools versus a child that has true chronic constipation that's been there for a very, very long time. And if you can see on the bottom right-hand side, right, right underneath me, um, you can see yeah. that because constipation occurs and the piping that we have is not made of steel, it tends to dilate out. And as the rectum tends to dilate out, over chronic constipation of months and months, even years, what happens is the rectum starts to become a huge vault and the path of least resistance is no longer out. It's to start accumulating in this vast giant vault. So when that happens, if you add more fiber at that point, you'll have softer stool, but ideally you wanna have re soft regular stools that are less bulky that allow your rectum to shrink down to a normal size. After you've reached good bowel movements and good bowel habits for months, if this has been a very chronic, long-standing thing, what happens then, you can add the fiber because no longer are you filling a huge space. It's shrunk down to normal size. So I tend to give fiber when I'm weaning off of uh, medications such as like glycolax or Miralax. Uh, if I'm weaning off of some of the, the magnesium medications or lactulose, at that point when they're weaning and switching, then I tend, I tend to find fiber far more effective. Mm -hmm. Because once you're not keeping a space enlarged, you're actually moving ahead. You're getting out of the water rather than just treading it. Great. Um, the, can you speak to Miralax? It's such a great component. And I actually had to correct somebody years ago because there was a mom blog about how toxic the substance was, was and they had misspelled it by a few words, uh, letters. And I realized it looked like something very toxic and if you don't understand organic chemistry, it's scary. But what, how do you combat that question, which we get all the time? And I feel like these people don't even appreciate how bad constipation is for the body. So what, what, do, you, what do you answer them when they're scared to use Miralax? Well, I, you know, I, I want to understand why they're, they're concerned. I don't want to, if they have a concern, I want to understand the root of it because I understand the science behind it and I use it quite frequently. And, and actually I was even practicing before Miralax came out in 2002, roughly in 2001. And before it was much more difficult because we had to use milk and magnesia. We had to use lactulose and we had to use mineral oil. Um, and if you think kids that have problems taking a, a Miralax, you should t try getting them to take a <laughs> mineral oil. Um, so what happened is, is it works. And I think the problem is, is that when, something works and it works well, people are suspicious. Wait a second, it, it can't be this good. I don't own any stock in the company and yeah, it is that good. Um, and one of the reasons is, is it's not an irritant, it's not a stimulant. All it does is lock water in the colon. So if you look at the bottom underneath me in that picture, what's happening there is the stool, the longer it stays in contact with the lining of the colon, the more water will come out. It'll just keep pumping water out. It doesn't think you know, this is a problem. Maybe I should stop pumping water out. Maybe I should stop making it bigger and harder. It's going to, you know, this is going to be a problem. No, that's not the way the colon does. It just keeps working and pulling the water out. And then what ends up happening is getting harder, larger, harder, larger, which then predisposes you for it. So the nice thing about Miralax is it locks the water in there so it can't just keep getting pumped out. So it doesn't irritate or stimulate. It doesn't cause water to come in. It just locks what water's in there into the colon. And the nice thing about Miralax is there's been more safety data on Miralax as a, as a laxative than all other medications used for constipation combined. People will use milk and magnesia and they'll say, oh, it's completely safe. Where's the data to support that? You assume it's safe because it's been out for 30 years or 50 years, but mm -hmm. there's no data on that. You assume mm -hmm. that, that certain things like Cairo syrup, lactulose, docusate sodium, macolis, oh, it's all so safe. Where's the data? There's more data on Miralax. And yes, Miralax is, is chemically similar to, to antifreeze. Yes, it's off by many molecules, but so are many medications that are one, one molecule away from a poison. Or, for example, as you know, in, in arrhythmia, a drug called digoxin is very close to a very toxic 
uh, molecule. But it doesn't matter how close it is. It's what it really is. Right. So right. I find that Miralax is very titratable. I find it that you can adjust the doses, but you want to give the same dose and you give it a little bit more, a little bit less without making big changes. And you get that perfect stooling that you need in order for the rectum to shrink down normal size and any withholding behaviors to, to, to uh, go away. And this is honestly so important that people are hearing this because a hundred percent of my patients who have to go see you for constipation were told to do Miralax. They did it for a month, maybe even less. They were supposed to do it for six months. They just don't stick to it. Then they have to come back to you to hear that they need to stick to it. <laughs> and then they do it. And if, after they do it and actually change, of course, changing diet is paramount. Learning about the starches and what foods you can and can't eat. And I can post that later after this talk in what foods are constipating, even you know nuts and apples are bulk forming. I learned that from you in residency. And the bulk forming foods you need to kind of steer clear of. So learning about that. Um, I'll flash up the the um, Bristol stool chart, the question I had sent you prior from a parent, um, they're posting again, the older child who's having those um, chronic stool issues since born, they've tried everything. Um, it never went away. Now his movements are about once a week um, and so extremely large that they clog the toilets. What should they do at this point? Well, this is what I was referring to. This is a classic description of it. Um, you see these kids that they get so constipated and they get that fear of stooling. So they withhold. And you, you'll notice that the patient will, you know, stand on their tiptoes. They'll be walking in the freeze and they're actually standing across their legs. What they're doing is they're using the glutes to control the stooling. Many times patients will come to me and parents will say, oh, you know, M Michael's trying to poop. He's trying to. No, he's not. He's actually he looks like he's straining, but he's straining to withhold it. And if they withhold it, it just gets harder and larger and harder and larger. And then eventually you'll pass a brick that you're like, there's no way that this could have come out of a child this size. It's, it's, it's impossible. But that's what ends up happening. Mm -hmm. What also they'll end up seeing is they'll see that they'll start having accidents or soiling, fecal soiling into their underwear with, without any rhyme or reason or warning. Many people will come to me saying their kid has diarrhea because they can't control their stool because it's a little tiny leakage mm -hmm. with stuff coming around the brick. Um, and that's what happens. And the problem is, is that no one wants to take any medication, whether it's the most benign medication in the world, longer than they have to, right? You don't want to, have to remember, you don't have to fight with your kid to make sure they take it. You don't want to have to pay the expense. You don't, there's a lot of things about, and you maybe just don't want to take anything. Mm -hmm. But the problem with, with very severe constipation with overflow incontinence is it doesn't go away. It's not a, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And that's what you have to get across. And you do a good job as well when you speak to your patients that this is a long-term solution. There are really no shortcuts on this thing. You have to clean them out and then you have to maintain them with soft, regular stools in order to allow the rectum shrink down to, to normal size, the withholding behaviors to go away, and also for sensation to start coming back. Because many times it's been so long that they have a problem that the sensation to the rectum has kind of just gone to sleep. So I even start in infancy when I start to see the stool after day, you know, day three, if the baby's really uncomfortable, to me, that's constipation. What I learned from you is if everything's normal and the baby, you know, and the ba the child, the stool, according to this Bristol stool chart is normal range. Every family has their own cycle, but I do like to start quite early. And I learned from a urologist, um, Pedialyte versus water, because we really don't have kidneys for babies that function well for the electrolyte balance. So prune, I, I know you're okay with prunes, prune juice, but then can you speak to this, um, call, the, the reflex when you start using the Q-tip and then the, the rectum starts to remember that and then you almost are retraining your body to use the stimulation, the rectal suppository or the glycerin chip and then they stool, you can't do that for too long, correct? It will, they'll start to learn that that's how you poop and lose the competency to just move move it through? Correct. So if, if your rectum becomes habituated to the need for stimulation or to contract, because that's what you do with a, with a Q-tip, rectal thermometer, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes even the windy device that people use, um, by stimulating the rectum, it causes a uh, reflex contraction, which expels the, the, the waste. And therefore, you do have success. But the problem is by doing it repetitively over and over and over, 
you can end up with addiction to being needing stimulation. Mm-hmm. Same thing with using suppositories. They work intermittently, absolutely safe and wonderful. But when you start getting you needing them multiple times, you know, a week, like three, four times weekly, every single week, then you should focus on the bigger problem rather than just fixing the problem or that you're seeing. Right. Right. And one thing I do want to uh, mention, there's two things about neonatal stooling or two things about, about infants with stooling that are very important to know. The first is um, when you do have a, a child that is exclusively breastfed, it is very common um, that they have some one moment. <laughs> It's a very common question we get about how often should my child, my infant should be stooling. Um, and even then it is about the consistency and looking, you know, showing what that poop looks like to your pediatrician. Correct. So what I was saying is, is that a breastfed, 100% breastfed infant can have very, very infrequent stooling. You can be stooling literally once every 20 days and it can be completely normal, provided the child's not irritable, gaining weight, growing well and when the patient does stool it's soft and that has to do with breastfed infants can be absorbing of their uh, the mother's nutrients so much that there's very little residual left to be waste so that you have to make sure that that's not a situation because then i have a lot of families say oh my kid's constipated but now the kid's eating well the kids is eliminating and everything's going fine so that's a very different situation and the second thing you need to re- recall is sometimes new parents look at their kids and the kids getting all bright red and straining and stuff like that but you have to remember a baby doesn't really know how to make a good push. They don't know how to contract the muscles of the abdomen and they're not helping with gravity, right? Because they're lying on their back and going this way rather than down. So a little bit of straining can be normal. Um, if you start seeing that they're very uncomfortable or they're having problems in feeding and things like that, those are the, the red flags that you need to notify your pediatrician about. Okay. I'm just making a little notes in the comments too for people who want to recap. Anything you want to say about the Bristol stool chart, and then we can move to the next question. Uh, well, it's very it's very helpful. Um, I, I use it in in my patients every day, even if they're coming in for reflux. Um, it's this very it's a it's a nice health marker indicator. There is no perfect stool. Um, mm-hmm. However, usual is in in the areas of three to five. That's usually the the, the area that that's that's normal. Babies obviously have looser stools, so they end up usually with stools more in the um, six area, so they tend to be a little bit looser. Um, but that I just use that to show them because it's very different when you ask, Are, "How do you, do you poop?" and they go, "Yes, I, I poop," and they'll say, "Well, once a day." But if it's once a day and it's, it's type one, it's just a small amount; it's not a complete evacuation. That's constipation, even though it's daily. Okay, so I'm just putting um, goal is really you want them to be type four. Three to five is, is, is generally considered normal. Okay, let me just put that in the comments. All right, let's go on to our next. Um, I don't see any other public questions. So let's go on to the next question we have here. Probiotics. <laughs> this, we don't have to spend too much time on this. Um, I just have a problem as a pediatrician when everything's going well. 50% of the time, especially in infants, when I add a probiotic, every all hell breaks loose. And I'm just like, oh, why did I, why, why? You know, these companies push it so hard and the baby was doing just fine. And then when a baby's really doing, not doing well on everything we try, I'd say that's the time to st- try a probiotic. How do you feel about probiotics? And let me hide the poop chart. All right. Um, I think... Probox definitely have their, their, their place. Uh, I think that, you know, you go back 20 years ago before we knew about Probox and the, what we call the flora or the microbiota of the, of the, of the GI tract. Um, mm-hmm. No one paid attention to how important these things were. And it's obviously very much affected by, by antibiotic use, diet, um, whether you're born vaginally or, or C-section. Um, But good bacteria are very important to the GI tract and absorption and possible fermentation, which causes excessive gassiness. I don't think that if if people are not having problems or your infant's not having problems, I don't think there's necessarily a reason they need to be on it. Um, If they're if they're doing great, I don't think you necessarily need it. If they're having problems. Yes. And I tend to find that actually probiotics tend to be better with looser stools tend to be better with excessive gassiness. Because what's happening is many times when a child is excessively gassy, there's only two ways to get gas in the GI tract. One is to swallow it, and babies do a lot of air swallowing. And the Mm -hmm. second is fermentation. 
And whether it's a baby or it's adult or it's an adolescent, it, does, it makes no difference. If in your intestines you have more fermentative type bacteria, they're going to make more carbon dioxide and hydrogen. They're going to take, break down your sugar and you'll end up with gassy and bloatiness. So I think that for the use of diarrhea and the use primarily of bloating or excessive gassiness, I think they're excellent. Um, you do need to be very careful with them, just from the standpoint of not necessarily are they dangerous, but because they're not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. And if it's not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, they do not need to prove that they come alive in your intestine. There could be 10 billion freeze dried and dead in the capsule, and you might as well be eating chocolate and dumping them down the sink because they're not helping you. So there are a couple of companies that have done studies that actually show that they come alive in the intestines. Now, they, they didn't... They didn't Pay, get paid to do it. They paid money to do it. And so they did show you that they have pharmaceutical grade product. The ones I tend to use are VSL number three, mm -hmm. Visbiome. C spell that. I know. Okay. Visbiome. Uh huh. Visbiome. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And a line. Those tend to be some of the best ones. Um, I tend to uh, shy away from uh, probiotic gummies. I think fibers are fine, uh, fiber gummies and, and whatnot, but I don't like the gummies or the tablets that have probiotics in them because you're trying to get a freeze-dried bacteria to come alive, and uh, many of the freeze-dried bacteria will not come alive after being freeze-dried just by general generality. But then you put hot gummy stuff over the top, you, it's, it's really going to decrease your yield. Um, the other thing is there's a Vivo, which is a probiotic that's especially for, for infants. And I find that those tend to be very, very helpful uh, for infants with some GI issues. And I do want to, you brought up a good topic that I am seeing so much. If I, I do get an hour at least, if not longer with my patients, so I watch them even bottle feeding the gassy babies. And one that I sent you, I just had mom send me a video of the feed. There's a huge air pocket. So the kid is, we we're wondering what's going on in the stomach, but the kid is actually swallowing air. So if you're um, if you're having a gassy baby, it might be worth making sure that there's a good latch. Yeah, absolutely. And, and once they start getting more air, they get distended, they get this uncomfortable, they cry, mm -hmm. they swallow air when they sw So you're in a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. I'm finding a lot of lip ties and tongue ties when I actually have time to spend on it. And that, that's that been surprising to me because I usually don't have time to watch the whole feed. Anyhow, um, yeah, thank you for talking about probiotics. I really didn't want to spend too much time on it, but they can cause me such a headache. There's just so much out there. And you're really hitting hitting on the point that's so true that if it's not FDA approved, everyone can spend money and it's just so gimmicky and salesy. And I never know. I, w I wasn't looking at Evivo very well because it was on Facebook and I'm like, Oh, here goes another company. But actually I finally met with some of their um, reps and looked at their literature and it's, it's pretty brilliant, but it, it has caused some problems for some of my babies when they were doing fine. So I'm not going to be introducing it when people are okay. When the babies are okay. Um, but yes, definitely, definitely awesome stuff and pre prebiotics as well. Awesome stuff. Okay, reflux. Let's talk about reflux and anything that you think is high yield and worth um, sharing because everyone knows what reflux is on a gross level, but not on the physiologic level. Whatever you think would be high yield for the public to know. Well, I think that that um, well, at least I think of reflux in, in two separate distinct uh, categories. Uh, one is the infant reflux. Um, and that has to do with physiologic factors, has to do with the fact that they're drinking liquids and not solids and liquids don't stay down as well, has to do with the fact that they have no truncal tone, so they crunch on their bellies, which increase pressure and cause reflux. It has to do with the fact that they're trying to grow in a growth curve that is like straight up and the Boda bag that has the, has the food is only so big. Um, it also has to do with the fact that they're not standing and their stomach is not in a horizontal or excuse me, vertical position which is anti-reflux, but it's lying sideways because they're not walking around and they're not cruising yet until nine months. So those are also predispositions. And then the last thing is that that closed valve down here that normally only opens after you swallow and peristalsis pushes it through and then it closes afterwards. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that just opens transiently in, in an infant because it's immature. It pops open. That's why you can see these kids will, will spit up with a vomit like three, two hours after a feed. You're like, well, how's that happening? Because it transiently pops open where it doesn't really open on us. But yeah. the good news for the infants is that they tend to grow out of it over time because a lot of those physiological things change. So that's mm -hmm. why it's worse around three, four months of age. And it gets better by year. About 65% of kids will outgrow it by year, 85% by year and a half, and 97% by two years of age. So that's 
that's a nice thing to know that, that your kid was reflux, even if they're on two medications or three medications because mm-hmm. they're very irritable and poor feeding, they still have those chances of growing out of it in that phase. So that, that's a nice thing to know as a parent. Second thing is as far as adolescent reflux or toddler reflux, that tends to be more like adult reflux. So things you should focus on initially before we think of anything to do with medications are avoid obesity because obesity puts pressure on the abdomen uh, or try to try to work on that. Try to work on constipation. Once again, if you're backed up, just like a sink, water will back up just like reflux. And if you have to squeeze and push really hard to get out, you're squeezing a tube of toothpaste with two exits and you're going to push it up. So you try to avoid constipation, overweight, and you try to avoid um, chronic coughing issues. So if your asthma is out of control, you're coughing like crazy, you need to work on that as well because that's going to make your reflux worse. And then you focus on diet. Um, Fortunately, most of our our patients are not uh, drinking and smoking a lot. um, And so that is a risk factor for for reflux. Uh, But there are other things that they love like tomato-based products like tomato sauce, catch up you have to cut down on those things because the, the chemical compound in tomatoes le- loosen the lower soft sphincter uh, same thing as well as onions and garlic chocolate that's a tough one to, to give up for many adolescents um or even toddlers uh not toddlers but younger kids and the last thing is is peppermint and caffeine uh they also tend to, to lower the lower soft sphincter so you try to avoid those things first before you would think of doing a, a medication Okay, that loosened the sphincter. One thing that was um, helpful for me, again, things I learned from my patients and reading your notes, which again, I have that extra time and pleasure to follow. Oh my, I have too much. I wrote too much on your comment and it won't let me send it. Okay, I'm gonna cut this up. Um, the, the in, there's certain age of infancy where the reflux will get worse and that there's like a height around four to six months. Is that correct? And then it will start to get be- better. So they shouldn't be surprised if at two months it's okay. And then four months it's out of control. It's around three to four months is when it gets worse. And yes. And that's, the, that's the thing is, is you'll, you have a patient who comes with a very irritable infant and they're spitting up all the time. It's irritable and they're like pulling away from, from feeding and they're, they're doing all sorts of stuff. If you even get them under control, say with a simple medication or even some some thickening of the formula or something of that nature, if they shouldn't be discouraged if they worsen when they hit around three or four months because that that's when it's worse. So absolutely, and and I always use the the, the figure if if you use spit up as a marker of reflux, mm-hmm. and you can argue that may not be the greatest marker, but if you use it as a marker at three months of age, two thirds of the United mm-hmm. States are going to be spitting up at one to four times per day. So that means two, two thirds of infants of that age are spitting up that often. And one third of them will spit up greater than four times a day. So it's very, very common to have spit up, but it becomes reflux disease when it causes an irritability problem or it causes a feeding problem or it causes a respiratory problem or it causes recurrent ear infections or some other issue. But if you have a happy spitting child, it's, that's not a disease. It's not a process that needs to be worked on because you know it's going to go away just like in, in the fashion I, I explained to you in, in, in the, the percentages. My daughter had some strange breathing at night where all of a sudden for five, 10 minutes, she'd be high pitched and kind of, we couldn't sleep well because it was just, <laughs> and she, um, ENT looked and she was actually refluxing into her vocal cords and had major swelling there. And I, I know that I had terrible reflux as an infant and child. So that would be another indication besides, a, she wasn't fussy. She yes. had the silent. Did more of a silent, you can have re- silent reflux where silent reflux means you're not seeing it come out the mouth, basically. So mm-hmm. you may not see actual physical evidence of the refluxant coming up. But for example, my own daughter, my uh, my youngest daughter had recurrent ear infections and a nasally voice yeah. all the time. Yes. And when we work very closely with ENT, we work uh, very closely with pulmonologists because there is a connection. It's all from the same system. Um, and it was a while and she sure enough, she had reflux and she didn't have a single drop of pain. She ate phenomenally and had no other issues. In fact, the ENT turned to me and said, Barry, what do you think about reflux? And I'm like, yeah, because you, when it's your own kid, you don't really think about it. But yes, yeah, that's exactly what she had. And, and when she was tested and she found to have significant reflux, especially at night. And that's the problem is at night she would chronically cough. And my other daughter never had any of that sort of problem. So yeah, these are the things you do need to keep alert out, notify you, pediatrician, who can then 
you know, segue if it needs to be segue to the specialist. Um, I want to tell parents that you will see kids doing this, pulling at their ears. The nerves are not so finely tuned. So when they have some sort of pain in the throat, sometimes they're doing this or burning. It's It could be some reflux, just as you were saying. Okay, it looks like um, we don't have questions that we were going to get a whole bunch of questions on reflux, but let's let's move to our next topic. Do you need to leave? We have it's we have another 10 minutes with Dr. Steinmetz. So if anyone has questions, now is your chance. Our next topic is um, anxiety and stomach aches. Is there an explanation? I know we know that stress decreases the barrier in the uh, stomach, but um, is there anything you would speak to about we know that you're going to see a kid with stomach aches when we just can't handle it anymore. But th it's a, one of the most common reasons people come to the pediatrician. I don't know how often it, they come to you, but what would you say about um, the mental connection with there, stomach? Yes, there, there's definitely an interaction. Irritable bowel syndrome um, can be a manifestation of this. And, and I see probably it's one of the top diagnoses I see. It's very, very common. Uh, the problem is, is that your brain and your gut are best friends and they are very well connected. Um, and what happens is there is, there is constipation. You get pain for constipation. And then there's irritable bowel syndrome where you actually have a hypersensitivity of your GI tract, where your GI tract is normally has what's called a, a negative inhibition feedback loop. So what normally feels is you feel contractions in your intestines, sends a signal up to the brain. The brain goes, whoa, I got pain. And then your brain goes, nah. That's background noise, quiet down. So it quiets, it quiets down. There are times, even when people don't have constipation or diarrhea or, or whatnot, where they have a lot of stress on them. Say you have a big talk to give, big presentation, uh, waiting for you know financial something, uh, problems with, with, with a spouse or girlfriend, or whatever. A stressor causes increased contractility and you will hear people get nauseated, pain, butterflies, they, they call it. What's going on there? Did you all of a sudden get an ulcer? Did you all of a sudden have a inflammatory bowel disease or H. pylori infection or, or a twisting of the gut? No. What's going on? You're getting hypersensitive, hyper stimulation from the stress that's causing more contraction. And what happens with irritable bowel syndrome is that normal quiet down side is weakened. So less stresses can cause more actual pain. And people will ask me, said, are you trying to tell me that all the pain's in my head? And I always say, yeah, every bit of pain you ever feel is in your head. It, it's electrical impulses that gets interpreted by the master computer up here. And if, and if you don't have a connection, say from a spinal cord injury or something, and you have an injury on a kneecap, or you, you, you slam your knee or something and you can't feel anything from the waist down, you have damage, but you don't have pain because the brain is not involved. So if the signals are mismatched, and that's what's happening with irritable syndrome, and it's exacerbated by anxiety or even depression, anything that, that exacerbates your, the contractions are going to give you more signal up. Got it. Your Wi-Fi kind of jumped in and out for just the last two sentences, but we got you. All right. Sorry. No, that's okay. So I have patients who will actually vomit on their way to school. They're so anxious and literally I'll have to give Zofran so they can get to school. And then some peps that AC tends to do the trick for them. They're okay. They get through school that way. Anything behind that? Just are we calming down the acid and then it's kind of, again, the wiring speaking to itself, like the stomach's feeling better and then the mental health is better? Well, it's probably it's probably a dual issue. Uh, like I said, the same thing is the stimulation. It's the overstimulation of the anxiety, increasing your gas uh, contraction, increasing acid uh, secretion. So it, it's it's just it's it's a feedback loop. And if you get a lot of stress people feel nauseous or they can functional nausea. People have heard of irritable bowel syndrome with alterations of bowel habits and constipation or diarrhea with the overstimulation, but they've rarely heard of what's called functional dyspepsia where eating makes them have more pain and they don't have reflux and they don't have an ulcer. And, and it has to do with that whole mind gut cycle. And as well, you can get functional nausea where you don't feel, you don't necessarily feel pain, but you feel actual nausea. And it's it's all that that cycle that that's amplified. So generally, I find there's an anxiety disorder in the parent, and then we talk about it, and maybe the child has anxiety disorder. Do you want these people to be seen by a therapist first, or should is it good for you to at least make sure there's nothing physiologic going on? Well, I would say that 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 if you, if you isolate 
that the primary problem is, is anxiety, true anxiety or true depression. Um, working with a therapist is probably the, the first step. If you find that they have alteration of bowel habits and things as well, then it might be more of a thing that 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 would that be uh, seen by me. But once again, even with my IBS patients, if they learn to cope and they have better coping mechanisms to stress and to anxiety, they tend to do better on their 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 uh, their GI tract, and they need less medications. So I would always fo would always say that if you do know that your your child has anxiety, you do know that your child has issues with uh, with stress, then you, you really should get them help in that, that fashion. It's going to help their lives in a lot of different things. Great. And then the last topic and so someone wants your website, so I'll post it. Um, it's just SoCal kids GI, right? Yeah. And you can uh, look up our, our business name, which is pediatric gastroenterology associates of Southern California or PGASC. That's the easiest way to find us. Let's see. And you're in Costa Mesa. As one of our, yes. Um, you can't, you know, there, I, I looked up Barry Steinmetz and it's either you or some politician or something else. So they okay. should be able to find you. Um, the last talk was going to be, the topic was diarrhea because I think it's a real easy, short, quick message to people who don't know any better um, regarding Imodium and what to do with um, pediatric diarrhea. And this is one of the beautiful parts about pediatrics. Kids can heal themselves and we give it time. There's not that much to do, but um, what would you say are the top, your top tips for pediatric diarrhea? And I guess time for us. Yeah, go ahead. There's a big difference between chronic diarrhea and acute diarrhea. Acute diarrhea usually is either due to food poisoning or it's due to a viral illness. Um, I'm sure you've seen a lot less of during COVID because everyone's been washing their hands, protecting, wearing masks and, and whatnot. But if you have acute food poisoning, you don't want to take an anti-diarrheal. In fact, my own daughter figured this out. Uh, just she called me a week ago and she had a persistent problem after she had some food poisoning. And I mm -hmm. said, I hope you're not taking any, any Imodium. She goes, oh, yeah, dad, I did. And that's why it lasted for almost two and a half days. Yeah, yeah. because you, what's happening is, is you're trying to get rid of a toxin. And your body's response is having diarrhea to get rid of the toxin. So you don't want to stop up a toxin or infection by giving anti-diarrheas. And, and as you know, even if you have C. difficile, you don't want to give anti-diarrheal in those patients because they can get sicker. So if it's the, the anti-diarrheals, you just got to be careful with. Um, in pediatrics, we tend to use them very, very infrequently because you really want the infection to, to flush through. Um, when it becomes something of a chronic diarrhea that's been persistent more than the, the actual definition is usually greater than seven to 14 days. That, that's when you need to be more investigative. Is this, is there blood loss in it? Is, is there blood even visually or occultly that you can be done at your office or my office? Because if you have blood and chronic diarrhea, your, your mind process is going to a very different spot versus if you don't have any blood or inflammation, then it might be a malabsorption diarrhea or something of that nature. So for, for a physician, it's very important to know, is there blood, is there inflammation, or is this a different type of a, a chronic diarrhea? Uh, oh, you froze. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. You froze. Oh. I'm just not moving. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, um, the common is, one of the more common questions around diarrhea is, what is it? What is it? Is it... Uh, but how do we know if it's food poisoning? Was it food poisoning? And, you know, I can only surmise so much about food poisoning. And I ask the most common questions about reheated old foods and deli meats and mayonnaise and reheated rice, all of that stuff. And once in a while, we'll find something. But um, do we really care? And is it important for me to help my patients find out if it was food poisoning? Of course, for reporting, if it was on a massive scale, yes. But yeah. Most, most food poisoning is not reportable. Uh, uh, most of the things like salmonella outbreaks are different, uh, but yeah. most food poisoning is actually a toxin that's ingested. Um, and usually if the toxin ingested, you'll have a, a, a sooner onset than if you have the bacteria that's ingested. So you're looking for food poison, usually onsets within four to, to eight hours of onset of whatever you ate. Um, and they mm -hmm. usually go away in 24 hours. It usually is a self-resolving process as you eliminate the, the, the toxin. I do find that it's very important to actually define diarrhea because what ends up happening is I've had patients in the past who'd say they have diarrhea and I say, well, why do you have di say you have diarrhea? Well, because I went, I had two bowel movements in a day. 
and it was completely normally formed. But in their mind, if you went more than once, it was diarrhea, right? So you really need to define it. Yeah. And the other key thing is a factor that tells you you have a real organic process going on rather than did they have too much sugary sweets or something that caused some irritation or something or ingested something is, are they waking up at night to stool? Because it's very abnormal to be awoken at night to have a bowel movement. So that's, that's a key that. factor saying there's a disease process going on rather than this might have just been something I ate or, um, you know, I had some bad chocolate or something. Like that, but it's very bad. To, it's very un, unusual. People will get up to urinate in the middle of the night at times, but to stool in of itself that caused you to wake up is very, very abnormal. Um, there was something. Oh, since uh, since being in this practice on my own, I've had a couple of patients with rectal prolapse. And I was surprised to learn from you again that that's that does happen with diarrhea and kids and it it self resolves. It's wonderful that it self resolves. because It's very alarming. And that's blood in the stool. So that would be some another reason to see your doctor, right? Correct. But, so rectal prolapse just really quickly is where where the chronic diarrhea or constipation. It's actually either one can cause chronic constipation, meaning you're, you're pushing to evert the, the lining of the GI tract. So you have this donut looking flesh thing that's uh, protruding from the rectum. And that's an actual prolapse versus seeing something that looks more like a finger like projection could be a juvenile polyp. And once again, the other great thing is, you know, being in pediatrics, polyps are not cancerous in 99.99999% cases in kids, which is nice. It's just, it tends to be something that needs to be removed, but it's not, it doesn't have any cancer risk. So yes, um, a prolapse, you need to keep the kids having regular stools if they're constipated. And if they're having diarrhea, you need to take away the diarrhea causer or what's causing the diarrhea. And it tends to get better. Very few patients need to have surgery to, to fix that. Okay. And but beyond the brat diet, any tips? Hydration and brat? Um, very, when you have diarrhea, just very good hydration. One thing I say, if, if you have acute food poisoning or you have a, a viral gastroenteritis where you're vomiting, I always try to tell the family, if the kid vomits, don't give them something right away. I mean, as a parent, you want to get fluid in. You're absolutely right. But if you give something within the first 15 minutes of a vomit, many it'll just come back because peristalsis is in the backwards direction. So what I recommend is doing very slow, steady things to keep hydration. So instead of giving like a slug of Gatorade, say six ounces at once, do one ounce little shots, take little sips. Keep doing it every two minutes on, the, you know, set your, your iPhone or your, your Android phone for every two minute alarms to just take a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. When you do it in that fashion, you can maintain really good hydration without having a uh, higher risk of vomiting. And in babies, I even yeah. encourage using a medicine dropper with PD light if needed yeah. in the back, you know, slowly dripping. So you get even five ml, slow, small amounts. Yeah. Well, great. Any any final tips? Um, I found you at so SoCalKidsGI.com. So that's what I shared. That's what came up when I put in the acronym Perfect. you gave me. Perfect. Uh, and you guys are located, you also are located in Irvine now, right? Well, actually, the Irvine Center unfortunately closed. Um, okay. Not It wasn't our one center, but the multi-specialty center uh, did close. So we moved. We are primary now in uh, Costa Mesa office. We're in Fountain Valley. We're in Long Beach in the brand new Children's Village for Miller Children's Hospital. It's a 80,000 square foot, beautiful, just built building. It's just wonderful thought of 100% milligrams per kilogram kid thought um, and up in Torrance in a specialty center. So we, we're, my groups, we're all over the place. So just if you call the number from the website, you can look at, at, at the individual ones. If you call the Costa Mesa office, uh, Rebecca, who's our office manager, she can facilitate any appointments anywhere. So just she's 100 percent reliable. I would love that. Well, your Costa Mesa office is I felt like I was going on a retreat when I came to visit. It's beautiful. Thank you. Love that building. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. And thank you even more for being available on my on my phone calls when I'm bu bugging you after hours. We all appreciate you in the community, and I'm so grateful I've gotten an education under you. I like to brag about that. And It uh, shows that I'm older than you is what it shows. <laughs> well, I started late, so it might look that way, but who knows how old I was when I started medical school. So thank you for all your help and time, um, and hopefully we can do this again if, if you have any other free time. Well, we can uh -huh. talk about maybe food allergies. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Stay healthy and have a good weekend. Bye, everyone.